Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. Well, October was a very exciting month, astronomically speaking. There was an annular eclipse, some amazing auroral displays that were seen as far south as Arizona. We also witnessed the launches of some groundbreaking space missions. And of course, Comet Chushinshan Atlas has been putting on a great show in the evening skies. Hopefully, you've had a chance to enjoy these treats and you're ready to enjoy what fun is in store in the November 2024 skies. So let's get to it with November's Planetary Roundup. Mercury begins the month very low in the western sky as darkness begins to fall. On November 1st, about 30 minutes after sunset, the innermost planet will only be about 3 degrees above the west-southwestern horizon. Mercury will be glowing at magnitude minus 0.34, and the disk of the planet spans about 5 arc seconds across, while appearing about 85% gibbous. By the middle of the month, Mercury sets about an hour after the sun, but it will be very low on the horizon, making it difficult to spot. By the last week of the month, Mercury will be lost in the glare of the sun. The best day is to try to spot elusive Mercury, will be from the 14th through the 17th, but make sure you have an excellent western horizon and use binoculars to try to spot it. On November 3rd, about 30 minutes after sunset, the two-day-old waxing crescent moon will be 7 degrees to the left of Mercury. Thankfully for us, Venus is much easier to spot this month. While this is not the best apparition of Venus, it is still putting on a nice show in the southwestern sky after sunset in November. On the 1st, Venus is shining brilliantly at magnitude minus 4, while showing a gibbous phase that spans more than 14 arc seconds wide. On the 1st, Venus sets at 7.49 p.m. By the end of November, Venus, which is now setting at 8.30 p.m., appears higher in the sky as darkness falls. It's also a bit brighter at magnitude minus 4.2 and now spans 17 arc seconds across while showing a 67% gibbous phase. On November 4th, the three-day-old moon will be 3.5 degrees below Venus, while on the 5th, the four-day-old crescent moon will be about 10 degrees to the left of Venus. Both of these events should look stunning. On November 1st, Mars rises a few minutes before 11 p.m., making it best seen in the pre-dawn skies. It's shining at magnitude zero, and its disk is spanning nine arc seconds across. The red planet spends all month long in Cancer the Crab. At the end of the month, Mars will rise at 8.30 p.m. and will have brightened by half a magnitude, and now appears more than 11 arc seconds across. While Mars is easy to see in binoculars, it's too small to appear as anything more than a bloated bright star. Spotting features like the polar caps on Mars should be relatively easy, however, if you're using a telescope. Of course, local seeing conditions will have a huge impact on your view, but it's always worth giving a try. On November 20th, the 66% illuminated waning gibbous moon will be about 6 degrees to the right of Mars, while on the 21st, The 56% illuminated waning gibbous moon will appear about 6 degrees to the left of Mars. Jupiter has taken over the title of King of the Night Sky from Saturn and rules all month long in the constellation Taurus, the Bull. The largest planet in our solar system rises just after 8 p.m. on the 1st and is glowing brightly at magnitude minus 2.5 while its disk spans 46 arc seconds across. By the end of the month, Jupiter rises at 6.41 p.m. and is now glowing at magnitude minus 2.8 and its disk is spanning 48 arc seconds across. You can see Jupiter as a very bloated star with binoculars. If your eyes are good enough, you might even be able to make out the darker equatorial bands. With binoculars, the four Galilean moons are easy to spot as they orbit Jupiter. In a telescope, especially after spending a lot of time at the eyepiece, you can make out all kinds of interesting details in Jupiter's ever-changing atmosphere. You can see features like the equatorial bands, as well as other bands on the planet, along with raging cyclonic storms like the Great Red Spot. By making careful observations and even using lucky imaging, 
you can reveal other smaller storms within the Jovian atmosphere. Jupiter's upper atmospheric features should be best seen in December when the planet reaches opposition, but it still looks great now, so make sure to take a look at it. On November 16th, the nearly full moon will appear about 9 degrees above Jupiter in the evening sky. On the 17th, the moon will be about 8 degrees to the left of Jupiter. Saturn will be in the southeastern sky in Aquarius at sunset on November 1st. The ring planet will be glowing at magnitude 0.8 and will transit the meridian when it will be at its highest peak and due south at 9.10 p.m. The planet's disk spans about 18 arc seconds across, while with the rings, it's about 44 arc seconds wide. Still in Aquarius on the 30th, Saturn will be slightly fainter at magnitude 0.9, and with the rings, the planet now spans about 40 arc seconds across. As the month ends, Saturn transits the meridian at 6.16 p.m. and sets just before midnight. With binoculars, you can see Saturn and its rings, but they are best seen in a telescope, especially now, as they appear very narrow. In March of 2025, the rings will appear on edge to us before they begin to open up again to their widest in 2039. In a telescope, the rings will appear obvious, and with practice and good seeing, you might even be able to detect the darker bands at the top of Saturn's atmosphere or Cassini's division, a gap in the rings. On November 10th, around 6 p.m., the nine-day-old waxing gibbous moon will be one and a half degrees below and to the right of Saturn in the southern sky. This will be a beautiful sight with the naked eye, but it will also be beautiful in binoculars or a telescope at low power. Uranus spends all month long in Taurus. On the 1st, Uranus rises at 6.33 p.m., and transits the meridian at 1.48 in the morning. Uranus is glowing dimly at magnitude 5.6, and its disk spans 3.5 arc seconds across. By the end of the month, Uranus rises at 3.35 in the afternoon, and transits at 10.45 p.m. Its size and brightness have not significantly changed due to its distance from us. On November 7th, Uranus will be at opposition, meaning that it is opposite the sun in the sky and will rise when the sun sets. Opposition is typically the best opportunity to observe a superior planet, although a few months on either side will still provide good views. Neptune spends all of November in Pisces. It glows faintly at magnitude 7.7 .7 and only spans two and a half arc seconds across, making it appear nearly stellar at low power in a telescope. In binoculars, it will appear as a faint bluish star. On the 1st, Neptune rises at 4.08 p.m. and transits the meridian around 10 p.m. On the 30th, Neptune transits the meridian at 7.07 p.m. You can try to use Saturn to help you find it, as Saturn appears about 13 degrees to the west of Neptune all month long. Now, with all the excitement that we've had with Comet Shushinshan Atlas, observers may be treated to another nice comet, C2024-S1, Comet Atlas, in early November. This comet was discovered by the Atlas Telescope in South Africa. Comet Atlas is a sun-grazing comet that will reach perihelion at a distance of less than 2 million miles from the sun. If the comet survives its close passage with the sun, we may be treated to another nice cometary show the first week of November. Unfortunately, though, as I record this, there are reports that the comet may have already disintegrated. Comets are very unpredictable, so only time will tell if it survives its trip around the sun. So definitely keep watching for it. So, while we may have been spoiled by Comet Shushinshan Atlas, when it became an easy naked eye comet for several days before fading to binocular visibility, here in New Jersey, we had a string of 10 clear nights in October, and I was busy capturing lots of images of the comet. All of these images of the comet were taken by me, right here in suburban New Jersey. It was a lot of fun capturing the images, and the processing, which can be tricky, went pretty well. I may do a future video about how to process comet images in Pixinsight if there's enough interest. The Southern Torrids, which peak on November 4th, is a weak meteor shower that under the best conditions will only produce about 5 meteors per hour. The Leonids, which peak on the 17th, will be tough to spot this year, 
as their peak occurs with a bright gibbous moon in the sky. SpaceX has been stealing the headlines with their extremely successful fifth test flight of the Starship, which is the largest, most powerful rocket ever built. During test flight five, we witnessed a successful booster separation, and then, like something straight out of Harry Potter, we witnessed the booster returning back to the launch pad, where it was caught by the chopsticks on the launch pad. A little while later, the Starship made a vertical landing in the Indian Ocean, where it tipped over and exploded after the landing. The wing flaps held up better this time, but there was still some flat material lost during re-entry. Test Flight 6 may see the Starship return to the launch site as well, where eventually it can be placed back atop a booster to be relaunched. On October 14th, the Europa Clipper was successfully launched aboard a Falcon Heavy rocket. Now it is on its six-year journey to the Jovian system, where it will explore Jupiter's enigmatic moon, Europa. Now it's time for the Lunar Feature of the Month. This month, we're going to explore the lunar crater Albategnius. This 85-mile-wide crater has a lot going on within it, and you could spend hours at the eyepiece exploring its features. The crater is named for the Mesopotamian astronomer Al-Batani, who was known as the Ptolemy of the Arabs. Despite doing his observations around 900 AD, his work was so accurate that it influenced early greats like Tycho Brahe, Kepler, and Halley, just to name a few. The crater itself is best seen when the moon is just before and just after first quarter, and again a couple of days before last quarter. During these times, the shadows appear at their longest, making them easier to see. Albategnius is a circular crater that measures just under 85 miles, or 136 kilometers wide. It is deep as well. The crater rim rises more than 11,500 feet from the floor of the crater. The crater has a relatively flat floor and features a prominent central peak that rises nearly 15,000 feet above the floor of the crater. At higher magnifications, you may notice the craggy nature of the shadow on the crater's floor. Along the southwestern rim of the crater is the 26-mile-wide crater Klein. Keen observers, using higher magnification, may spot the central peak in Klein along with several craterlets. The floor of Albategnius is home to several small craters, and the rim of the crater is pockmarked with lots of small craters as well, ensuring hours of entertaining observing. Albategnius is easy to locate as it lies just south of the crater Hipparchos and just east of the lunar snowman, which we'll talk about more next month. You can spot Albategnius in binoculars, but it is best observed in a telescope. So I implore you, go out and enjoy this fun crater. Now let's move out of the solar system for our deep sky tour of the constellation Andromeda. In Greek mythology, Andromeda is the daughter of King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia, and eventually she becomes the wife of Perseus. This constellation is easy to find, as it shares its brightest star with Pegasus, well, sort of, as Alpharat represents the star in the northeastern corner of the great square of Pegasus. Alpharat, the brightest star in Andromeda, shines at magnitude 2 and is a double star system. The primary star is classified as a mercury-manganese star, as there are high levels of those and other metals in the star's atmosphere. Alpharat is the brightest known mercury-manganese star. Its companion is fainter than 10th magnitude and appears very close to the primary. It orbits the primary star every 96 days. The Alpharat system lies about 97 light years away from us. Alpharat is a great place to begin our tour, but now let's explore a handful of deep sky objects that Andromeda showcases. We're going to start with some of the lesser known objects before getting to one of the greatest trios of objects in the entire night sky. Our true first deep sky object that we'll explore this month is the open cluster NGC 752. This large, bright open cluster was discovered by Caroline Herschel in 1783. We did an episode about Caroline Herschel in our Great Astronomer series. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. 
glowing at magnitude 5.7 and spanning one and a quarter degrees across, this cluster is located 1,400 light years away from us. NGC 752 is made up of at least 302 stars. From a dark site in Vermont, I've just barely been able to spot this with the naked eye, where it appears as a faint glow. In binoculars, the brighter members of the cluster begin to resolve amidst a hazy background about twice the apparent size of the moon. In a telescope at low power, this cluster is fun to explore. There are many bright, colorful blue stars that can be seen with a wide field eyepiece. In my 8-inch Dobsonian, the cluster almost looks like a myriad of blue and white diamonds scattered on black velvet. It's a real beauty. Locating NGC 752 is easy to do. Start at magnitude 2.2 Almach, also known as Gamma Andromedae, and sweep south for 4.5 degrees. Then sweep west for 1 degree and you'll spot NGC 752. The next object on our tour is the Silver Sliver Galaxy, which is cataloged as NGC 891. This is a beautiful spiral galaxy that we see edge on. It is believed that our galaxy, the Milky Way, would appear similar to NGC 891 if we could see it from the same perspective. The galaxy glows at magnitude 10.8 and spans 13 by 2.5 arc minutes in size and is located about 10 million light years away from us. You'll want dark skies to try to spot this one, as it can be a little bit of a challenge. I've seen it in binoculars from a dark sky site here in New Jersey, where it appeared as a small, faint streak of light. In my 70mm refractor, the galaxy is easy to see with direct vision. The dark lane begins to show itself after careful observations. In my 8-inch SCT, the galaxy sort of looks like two upside-down plates with a fainter area in between the two plates. Careful observations show brighter and darker areas throughout the galaxy. While being a bit of a challenge to spot, it is easy to locate. Start at Almach and sweep 3.5 degrees east and you'll be looking right at the galaxy. Our next object is brighter and smaller, which will make it easier to see. NGC 7662 is commonly known as the Blue Snowball Nebula. It is a planetary nebula. Planetary nebulae occur when sun-like stars are near the end of their life cycles and begin puffing off their outer layers of gas, eventually leaving a large glowing shell of gas and the central star, which for NGC 7662 is now a white dwarf that glows faintly at 13th magnitude. The blue snowball is one of the brightest planetary nebulae in the sky. It glows at magnitude 8.4 and spans 32 arc seconds in size, although its brighter inner shell is only about 12 by 18 arc seconds. It is located about 5,700 light years from us, and it's young at only around 3,000 years old. It was discovered by Sir William Herschel on October 6, 1784. Yes, that is Caroline's older brother and we have an episode about him as well. The link for that is in the show notes. You can spot this nebula in binoculars, but it will only appear as a faint bluish-green star. In my 70mm refractor, operating at 100 power, the nebula appears as a small, elongated green glow, while in my 8-inch SCT, at 185 power with a nebula filter, the inner shell is easy to see and well-defined, while the faint outer shell can be seen, especially if you're using averted vision. This is when you focus your gaze on the edge of the field with your target in the center, causing you to use your peripheral vision, which can help to make fainter objects visible. I've been able to observe the central star pretty easily using a 10-inch scope. The last stop on our tour is one of the finest showcase objects in the entire sky. It is large, bright, and has lots to offer. It is also the closest major galaxy to us. I'm referring, of course, to the Andromeda Galaxy, or M31. Now, we've discussed M31 several times over the years, but this galaxy is worth repeated visits. I have a lot of fondness for M31. It was the first deep sky object that I attempted to shoot when I got back into astrophotography. That attempt did not go very well. Fortunately, I've revisited M31 many times, both visually and photographically. As I write this, 
I'm just finishing collecting more than 20 hours of data on M31, which I used to produce this image. M31, which is cataloged as NGC 224, is a barred spiral galaxy that shines at magnitude 3.4 and spans 3 by 1 degrees in size. It is located about 2.5 million light years away from us. The Andromeda Galaxy has two bright satellite galaxies, magnitude 8 M32, which is about 8 arc minutes in size, making it appear as a very bloated star, and its other companion is M110, which glows at magnitude 8.5 while spanning 22 by 11 arc minutes in size. The inner core of M110 is pretty easy to see in most telescopes. These three galaxies make up the great Andromeda galaxy, and in 4 to 5 billion years, they will collide with the Milky Way, eventually creating a huge elliptical galaxy. M31 is the furthest object that most people are able to see with the naked eye. However, to the naked eye, the Andromeda galaxy only appears as a large, faint, hazy patch of light, even under dark skies. In binoculars, the bright core of M31 becomes obvious, and from dark skies, I can begin to trace the spiral arms of the galaxy with my 7x50 binoculars. In my 70mm refractor, at very low power, the galaxy becomes well-defined. The dark lanes between the spiral arms can be seen, as can the satellite galaxies. But my favorite views of M31 have come through my homemade 8-inch f4.5 Dobsonian. That mirror took me 17 years to finish, but it came out well and gives nice images. I recall a time in the 1990s under a very dark sky in Vermont, spending over an hour exploring M31. Using a 35mm panoptic eyepiece, which yields 26 power, with a field of view a little less than 3 degrees wide, I must have stared at that view for at least 10 minutes. It looked a lot like what you see in pictures, just not as bright. The details were amazing, the dark lanes were evident, as were both satellite galaxies, and I was even able to see more than just the core of M110. Switching to a higher magnification view, I put in my 20mm Nagler, which gives a view of 46 power in a field that's nearly 2 degrees wide. Now I could see bright knots in the spiral arms, and even some details in the dark nebulae. After a while, I put in my 11mm Nagler, which gives me 83 power, with a field of view that's 1 degree wide. NGC 206, which is a bright star-forming region in M31, was now easily visible. The details in the spiral arms were obvious, and patches of light could be seen behind some of the dark nebulae. It was absolutely incredible. Now, locating M31 is extremely easy. My favorite star-hopping method is to begin at Alpharats and sweep left to the next two bright stars, then up two stars, and you'll be looking right at the galaxy. Hopefully, you'll go out and get to enjoy these objects for yourself. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You can visit our YouTube channel, The Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please do all the podcast and YouTube things like like, subscribe, comment, and share. It really makes a huge difference and does help us. If you'd like to help support the Astro Guy podcast and YouTube channel, you can do that by buying us a cup of coffee. The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish the show. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for joining us, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. <laughs>